Um, let me just admit Andile. All right, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, Lord, to be alive. Yo, in the midst of uh, circumstances, we find ourselves in uh, challenges left, right, and center, including COVID-19. But here we are um, to sit and listen to a word encouraging us, Lord, and giving us ideas on how to work with ambassadors. And we are so grateful, Lord. And we pray that, Lord, you may be with us. And we know you are already with us because you are God Emmanuel, a God who is always with his people. Continue blessing us, Lord, even those who will be watching us live on Facebook, may they be blessed. We pray that, Lord, may be with uh, Dr. Conrad. Uh, give him, Lord, all the ideas, Lord, to share with us in this platform. And may we all be equipped through his words. Thank you so much for an opportunity to work with and for you, Lord, in your vineyard, even though we are so unworthy. But, Lord, you gave us this chance so that we can minister with you. Thank you so much for your pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the, the program is going to run as follows. We're just going to welcome everyone on social media. And then from there, we're going to introduce uh, Conrad from the college. Um, and uh, from there, we will allow him to share his message. And then afterwards, we'll allow some, some maybe questions. Um, if we mm. can't answer the questions, we will say, we'll go, we'll, we'll put that question on the, on the bookshelf for a later stage. But, but yes, so this, this is, will hopefully deem to be an interactive session at the end, close to the end. There will probably be yeah. a few questions coming through on Facebook, but, uh, but yeah, we shouldn't be longer than an hour. Um, and then we'll, we'll log off after that. So I hope you'll be, you'll be blessed tonight. Um, I'm going to go live now. And as soon as we go live, I'll then uh, welcome everyone on Facebook and uh, we can have a word of prayer then again. Yeah. All right, so we're live on Facebook and uh, welcome everybody. I, I hope that you are doing okay under the circumstances that we find ourselves with COVID and uh, also maybe a few struggles at home, but with the cold and everything like that, now all of a sudden load shedding also hitting us. We pray that, that God will still uh, provide enough electricity for us to stay warm. And, uh, from those on Facebook, welcome. My name is Pastor AJ de Villiers, and I have with me Pastor Bumela and uh, Pastor Monet Furstenberg and all the ambassador directors of the Cape Conference. And then lastly, but not least, we have Conrad Zygmunt from the Helderberg College um, in Somerset West. And I would like to welcome, welcome you and Hopefully the Lord will bless you as you go through this evening. And as we look at tonight's uh, title, you'll notice it says, Connecting with our generation of socially alienated and technologically connected youth. And how we can uh, um, get everyone to understand how to connect with each other, yet we're disconnected with each other. So as we move mm. forward, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Bumela to maybe <coughs> pray for us, and then we'll head over to, to Conrad. Thank you so much, Pastor AJ. Welcome to everyone, uh, our ambassador, leaders in the, in the local churches. I see a few of our uh, vice chairpersons uh, for YCOMS. We're happy to have you. We, we also hope to hear more from you as to what has been taking Hello, place in our local churches. Shall we bow our heads as we pray? Heavenly Father, we have this team, our soldiers, uh, who are ready to listen to your word this evening, Lord, so that they can go back to our ambassadors and share the good news. And I pray that, Lord, you may be with us all especially Dr. Zygmunt, bless him, Lord. 
And as you bless him, Lord, may you bless each and every one of us, including our ambassadors, wherever they may be, watching at this moment. Bless us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you, Conrad. Thank you for being here. Okay, thank you uh, very much for the invitation. Um, AJ asked me if uh, I'd be willing to come and talk to you guys a little bit about connecting with the youth. Um, so those of you who don't know me, I'm a, a lecturer in the psychology department at Helderberg College of Higher Education. Mm -hmm. I have the privilege of working with youth and yep. uh, that privilege is sometimes frustrating and sometimes very uplifting and, and, uh, and very pleasant as well. Um, I wanted to share just an experience that I had recently. I, um, I have had the opportunity of uh, getting a young uh, one of my previous students to come in to be a tutor and uh, sometimes I experience the frustration of not really understanding why my students are behaving the way they're doing why um, they make the decisions they do etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, my my tutor was working with them and um, the tutor was just a year or two out of 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 college and uh, it was very very entertaining for me listening to my tutor expressing their frustration about how the students were behaving and the difficulty the tutor was having <laughs> with engaging with the students and I just sat back and I thought a little bit about it and you know to an extent this uh, gap that exists we often talk about a generation gap is a gap that doesn't exist just between generations. It's a gap that exists between each and every one of us. Each and every one of us are different in some way to every, every single other person. And yet each and every one of them, us also has some important similarities that help us to be able to connect and to be able to feel that connection with someone else. Mm -hmm. And so with youth, it's very important to understand what are these differences? And what are these similarities? So I wanted to read to you from uh, 1 Timothy 4. In 1 Timothy 4, um, Paul is giving instruction and he says to him, um, these things command and teach. The first thing he says is, let no man despise your youth, but be you an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And he says, neglect not the gift that is in you, which was given you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the, of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give yourselves wholly to them, that your profiting may appear to all. Now, for me, this is a very interesting verse because it starts off with that distinction of youth. And he's exhorting him not to, not to allow anyone to despise that youth. And what does it mean? What does that youth mean? And uh, it's quite interesting taking a look in, in research context how people differentiate youth how people differentiate different generations all the way from the baby boomers all the way through to millennials and what they're calling the I generation now. And we find that context shapes the way in which um, people develop. So um, definitely economic hardships at certain times, definitely wars, um, when we think of the World War II and the, in that time period, the social context of the time definitely has a very strong influence on the youth. And so we find, for example, youth um, that are recovering from um, wars and famines, etc., tend to be very hardworking, tend to have um, less emotional connection with their children, you know, etc. And then we have the children at this generation where there is so much abundance, but at the same time, so much poverty. 
these youth seem to be quite different and shaped by their circumstances. So the research that has been done seems to suggest that youth these days are very sensitive to social um, problems, to diversity, to um, sort of social issues of their time. Youth are also a lot more um, disconnected from each other while at the same time seeking connection through technology. And technology seems to be the primary means by which they seek that connection. And that can be a very good thing, but also a very bad thing. Um, some of the research suggests that youth are spending upwards of five to six hours um, a day on their mobile devices trying to connect, trying to fill that need of longing to be wanted and to find others that want them. And so they're spending all of this time, but the research is suggesting that the more time they spend on these devices, the more socially isolated they feel and the poorer their mental health is. And so we have to understand that in this context in which youth are living, they have the same basic needs that we had as youth. But the way in which they play out in the social context is very different. And so two of the primary drivers for youth is a feeling of connection, which we also experience as adults, but we seek it in different places. And uh, we, we, we get it a lot easier because we have families, because uh, we get that sense of connections from our partners, from our workplace, etc. But youth really have to negotiate a very turbulent and changing social space in order to, to meet that need for connection. The other very important need that youth have, especially as they move from adolescence, so when we're looking at our sort of teens onward to our, our young adults, is the sense of identity, of knowing who they are. This is something we take for granted, you know, as we, as we look back, you know, sometimes I, I don't see myself in the mirror for a while, and uh, I forget that I'm getting older. And uh, I'll take a look in the mirror and they'll say, but, you know, I can see there's some gray hairs coming up there. I can see that there's very little left on the top here, but I don't feel that much older from year to year. And so in a sense, we sometimes lose track of how we've changed inside. We lose track of the sense that we know who we are, that we're comfortable with ourselves. And we forget how difficult that is to get to that stage when we're young people. And so we see the vacillitudes of youth. We see how easy it is for youth to switch from one space to another space, to behave differently when they're in the church with their, in their, with their friends. And we see this as a weakness because in ourselves, we have such a strong foundation in terms of who we are, at least we should have by the time we get to leadership positions, which most of you who are watching are occupying. But in youth, we haven't formed that. And so the social context in which we live, which these days is both the virtual context as well as a real life context, really shapes the way in which youth understand themselves and in the way in which they interact with one another. So it's very important for us as leaders to understand that that when youth are spending hours on their phones, when we see them sitting in the church, and I must admit this is something that personally irks me a lot, um, and there's a sermon and someone is sitting and they're on Facebook in front of you or whatever the case may be, you need to understand that this is a primary need that they have of connection. And as youth leaders, it's our job to try and see how we can facilitate that need to be met in the church. And that need may not necessarily mean that they will behave in the same way that we do, but that we can understand that their behaviors are driven by those primary needs that they have. A very important thing to understand as well is where children are, uh, youth and teens and adolescents, in terms of their development. Our brains are not fully developed until, um, some research is suggesting already mid-30s, but 
the consensus is that our uh, prefrontal cortex is only fully developed towards our late 20s. And this is really the area of the brain that we use in order to make rational choices, in order to plan behaviors, in order to monitor our own behavior, etc., which is sometimes what we see lacking with adolescents. They are much more willing to take risks. They are much more willing to be creative and try different things. And this can be a strength that we can utilize when we're working with youth. So I wanted to just point out briefly um, some of those changes that take place that helps us to understand why youth behave in the way that they behave. So one of the things that we see is just before adolescence. Um, so for example, pre-adolescence, the, the rate of uh, glucose metabolism in the brain, oxygen consumption in the brain is much higher than what we've got as adults or that what adolescents will have as they, as they develop. What's happening with those young children, and we've identified this as well, is that that age from 6 to 12 is so, so important, and before then as well, because this is really where all the development is taking place, where all the cells are starting to grow, the connections are being made, and um, a lot of the, the future potential of children is formed at that age. But what is happening then um, as children are moving through into adolescence is there's a dramatic shift in the kind of activity that's taking place in the brain. Rather than rapid growth and proliferation of connections, what's happening is we're getting stronger modules that are being developed in the brain, which are dealing with specific kinds of um, functions at different times. And I think the one that anyone who's got teenage children will relate to very well is emotions. One of the primary areas of development at this time, which is also spurned by uh, surges in hormones, is the limbic system. And the limbic system is, in, is responsible for our emotional expression, our feeling of emotion, as well as regulation of emotion working with the prefrontal cortex. And so adolescents will tend to feel emotions very differently than what we feel them as adults. You know the saying of making a, a mountain out of a molehill. So little things will tend to take on huge significance. Um, their understanding of temporal dimensions of feelings are not as good. So something that we understand to be passing. An emotion can be changed within 90 seconds. But for youth, an emotion becomes enduring because it's something that they don't understand how easy it is for it to move if given time and for, with the right approaches because they haven't got those areas in the brain that are important for self-regulation. And so to a large extent with young children, we create contexts that allow for self-regulation. We make specific rules and regulations that... Um, predispose children to behave in the ways that we want them to. But as they get into adolescence, we can't do that with them anymore. They need to be given space to develop their identity. But at the same time, they don't have the ability to regulate their emotions. And so how do youth regulate their emotions? They focus on connection. So what they'll do is they'll reach out. So they'll send the tweet or they'll put their post up on or their, their status on WhatsApp or on Facebook and they'll say, I'm feeling down, you know, or, oh, I'm not as beautiful as I'd like to be, or I wish I was more athletic or, you know, whatever it is that they're feeling. And they're doing that because they find that they can get acceptance, they can get empathy, they can get a feeling of, I'm not the only one, based on the kinds of responses that they're getting. And this serves a short-term function of self-regulation. It helps them then to manage their feelings and their moods. Whereas as adults, we should have developed that ability to regulate our own emotions. But that's only something that will develop much later. What you'll find is that there's big changes in gender 
So um, because the hormones are very different, so your, your androgen hormones that males are, are, are having are correlated very strongly with developments, for example, in limbic systems like the amygdala, um, which are linked with aggression and things like that. So boys tend to experience more um, hostility, aggression, etc., that kind of feeling. And that's part of the development of that area of the limbic system during those teenage years. So they'll be more prone to rough and tumble kind of play. They'll be more prone to um, solving their problems through aggression. And there again, we need to understand what's taking place and then work with it to help them to guide how to develop that. Girls, on the other hand, have a very different developmental system at this time. Um, their um, uh, sort of uh, hormones that are being produced and that are flooding through are linked with development in other areas of the brain. So, for example, a good area for them to develop is the hippocampus. Um, girls normally during uh, their teens and adolescence have a larger hippocampal area than, than males will have at the same age. And this is linked again with emotions, but also with memory. And so sometimes you'll see they hold a grudge for much longer. Um, they tend to be able to remember better, etc. So these are, are, are important areas of, dif of differentiation. But it's very, very important to also focus on the areas of similarity. One of the areas that I'm very interested in is spiritual development in youth. And um, there's a number of good books, Learner and a number of theorists have been working in this area. And we find that there's um, growth in, the, in certain areas of the brain that relate to spirituality. So one of the areas but which, which develops only much later on is called the ACC, it's the anterior cingular cortex. So it's an area of the brain that helps us to resolve conflicts. When we've got many different conflicting messages coming in from the brain, from different centers of the brain, it helps to try and guide which is going to give pre pre um, preeminence in terms of the final outcome that we will experience in terms of decision-making processes, emotions, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a very important component that's developed during religiosity during spirituality so for example prayer that ability to sit down and pray and speak to god and pour out your heart and shut off all the distractions so while you're praying and that sort of thought pops up and it says oh you know what uh, this week there's so much work that needs to be done or oh that person really dissed me on facebook or whatever the case may be um Activities like prayer and Bible study are helping to shape those areas of the brain. And so we find that from a psychological perspective and from a spiritual perspective, their involvement in church activities in core functions of our spiritual lives, like Bible study, like prayer, like witnessing, are so important in terms of their own development. And so I think that's why... Um, Ellen White has given so much emphasis on focusing on youth and not leaving them out of church. So I've got a, a quote that I wanted to read to you, um, which comes from the Review and, ha and Herald. If you want to read the full, um, the full quotation, it's from the Review and Herald. It's March 24, 1891. And um, I think this is really, really relevant to the discussion we have today. So she, says here, she says here, the youth are objects of Satan's special attacks. And obviously Satan is going to attack the areas where they are weakest. Their emotions and their feelings and their ability to regulate that. Their desire to explore their identity and and. The way they, do, they develop their, their identity is largely through experimentation. And Satan will what, try and use those to attack them. And so how do we counter that? So Ellen White wrote, and she said, the manifestation of kindness, courtesy, tender sympathy, and love will often work the salvation of those who are under the temptations of the evil one. The love of Jesus will win you an entrance 
into the heart of the young. And when you have obtained the confidence of the youth, they will listen to your words and take your counsel. You should bind them to your heart by the cords of love and then instruct them how to labor in the cause of God. The youth may labor for their young companions in a quiet, unpretending way. This branch of God's work must not be neglected. Our churches are not doing what they might do for the youth. There seems to be no burden for the souls for whom Christ died. Why should this labor for the youth in our borders not be the thought and not be thought the highest of missionary work? Why do the ministers leave the youth without endeavoring to win them to Christ? Why do they not urge the young to give their hearts to God? This work will require the most delicate tact, the most thoughtful consideration, the most earnest prayer that heavenly wisdom may be imparted. For connected with the church are those who are not ignorant of our faith, yet whose hearts have never been touched by the power of divine grace. Now, I really, really like this, uh, this quotation from Ellen White because it has so much in it that is so relevant to the research and the understanding of what is happening with youth in these days. One of the primary things that comes out from what Ellen White advises is this importance of empathy and warmth. And um, incidentally, this is quite interesting because in research on, on counseling with youth, the primary mechanism by which youth are reached in counseling is through report, is through warmth. And research suggests that up to 70% of the effectiveness of counseling with youth is based on that ability to connect and to express genuine uh, love, caring, and empathy for youth. Another very important thing that comes through to me um, in this, uh, in this uh, passage is that Ellen White says that the youth may labor for their young companions in a quiet, unpretending way. This is quite important. I think this is any parents' frustration, as well as youth directors and ministers working with youth, is that it's often very difficult to connect with youth. But you connect very easily with one another. And so you should be encouraged to take leadership roles in the youth ministry that we are working in, because they are in a position they can connect a lot easier than what we can. This is a, a normal part of life. It's much more difficult for me to con connect with someone who doesn't speak my language, doesn't look the same as me, comes from a different social class, whatever the case may be. And as much as I may want to connect and want to work with them, someone who is similar to them will always find it easier, speaking the same language and connecting with them in a way that I can't. And so part of our work in youth ministry is enabling youth to reach out to other youth and to become leaders in the ministry of youth. So this is very important when we're working with, with youth ministry. Sometimes our role um, as all the leaders. And I hope sometimes I don't want to class myself in that category, and I'm sure many of you feel the same way. But take your lead from how the youth see you is actually to support the youth in taking the leadership in youth ministry. So very important is working with the youth and helping them to feel that connection. So how do we do that with um, youth in we don't speak their language sometimes. And I'm not talking about Kosa or Zulu or, or anything like that. I'm talking about their interests, their life experiences. I'm talking about their, um, what they get excited about. It's not sometimes what we get excited about. So how can we then be almost culturally different to this generation which is technologically advanced, which is more emotional, more sensitive, more, um, I want to use the word politically aware, but I think that has different connotations. Maybe I'll say socially aware, um, then maybe our generation. So I'm going to give suggestions based on what we 
typically use in counseling with youth. Um, and these are strategies that are used that have to come from a genuine desire to connect with youth. You have to understand that one of the things that makes the youth different from, from previous gener generations is that they fed a lot of nonsense all the time. People are trying to buy them. Remember, they spend most of their time on social media, on, on their phones, on tablets, etc., which the primary purpose of that technology is to sell things. The primary purpose of that technology is to get a spike of dopamine out of engaging in the technology so that you can have people's attention so that they will buy something. And so youth are constantly bombarded with messages of trying to get them hooked onto something, whether it's to buy something or watch a specific movie or um, get an app, whatever it is. And so they're very sensitive to disingenuity, to when someone is unauthentic in dealing with them. So if you're going to be involved in youth ministry, don't do it because you've been put there. Do it because you genuinely love and care for youth and want the best for them. Because they'll be very quick to detect that as, they, as you work with them. So the first way to, to deal with youth is to meet their needs. Remember, they have a need for connection. And connection means that I care about how you feel. So the first way to deal with youth and how to relate to them is really take the time to express genuine concern and empathy for the experience, for the understanding, etc. I think one of the primary reasons why youth feel um, better connection with their peers rather than with their parents is that they expect from adults that there will be a judgment, that there will be a, a finger wagging and a talent of what they should do. Whereas adolescents don't necessarily do the same thing with their peers. Very often they'll affirm their position, even if they're in the wrong position. Um, and so they tend to be left defensive and have less resistance for um, communicating with their peers. Very important thing with adolescents is remember that teens and adolescents, and to a certain degree youth, remember youth are not necessarily in the same category as teens, um, is they don't have a well-developed ability to reason. And the best way in which you can support them through their choices is asking them open-ended questions where they have to come up with answers. So when they are struggling with uh, relationships, et cetera, ask them open-ended questions where you say, well, what do you think will happen if you continue to engage in this? You know, uh, this thing? Or what do you think are, are the, your alternatives are, et cetera? Here, you're not telling them what to do, but you're opening up all of the opportunities for them. You can guide them through that process where they may be more, um, you may be more risk averse and they may be more willing to try something you would, would have a negative outcome. As you guide them through the process, through open-ended questions and showing that warmth and empathy to them, they'll be more likely to then discover for themselves what is the best path to take. One of the ways in which you can show your genuine concern African culture being very uh, collectivistic. Um, the youth that we have now are possibly the most individualistic that we've had in, in, in many, many, many years. Um, they tend to want to express themselves. They tend to want to form their own opinions. They um, don't want anyone changing their ideas or telling them what to do. And so it's very important that you give them that sense of control or autonomy. So in other words, making a statement like, you need to decide for yourself which path to choose. But I want you to know that this path is open to you and that path is open to you. And no one should pressure you into taking this path or that path. So by giving them those options and guiding them into the right options, you're still opening them the opportunity to make the choice and emphasizing that you respect their autonomy. 
and their sense of will. This is a difficult thing to do as a parent sometimes, never mind as a youth leader. But we have to remember that that's the way that God works with us. Um, he never forces us into the right choices. That's not to say that he doesn't guide us into what choices are correct. He speaks to us continuously through his word and continue through, through um, his Holy Spirit. But he never forces us, even when we do make the wrong decisions. And so when youth are making those wrong decisions, one of the most important things for you to do as a youth leader is to work with those decisions. And I'll compare this to, um, I had a good analogy to use, and now it slipped my mind. Um, oh yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll compare this to surfing. Excuse me for using an analogy that, uh, that AJ and myself can relate to. But sometimes when you're sitting in, 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 in the back line of, uh, of, of when you're catching waves, when you're surfing, the breakers come in and you want to be just behind where they break. Now, every now and then, you'll find that waves will come in that are a little bit bigger than the others and they'll break further out. And if those waves break on top of your head, it's not a pleasant experience. And so you'll want to swim out to catch them there at that spot. But if you stay at that spot, then you're not going to catch any more waves for a long time. So what I'm trying to say here is that every now and then when you're working with teens, they'll make wrong decisions and it'll feel like a wave has just broken over your head. And you'll feel like you need to change your position and you need to go sit somewhere else. Um, maybe be more assertive with them or whatever the case may be. But I really encourage you to ride out their negative um, choices. If they make a negative choice, stay with them, support them. Um, not necessarily, I'm not saying support bad decisions, but I'm saying support them in their growth through those decisions. They're going to need someone who accepts them, who's willing to help them when that wave breaks on their head, right? Or when things don't turn out the way that they're expecting. So that's a very important point as well. The next point is work with them um, from a non-judgmental perspective. And this is quite a difficult thing. I, I think this is one that I experience a lot of difficulty for with. I have very strong views. And sometimes those strong views bite me. Um, I had a very, very bad experience where I was witnessing to neighbors of ours. And we were talking about the state of the dead. And I had prepared a PDF that I had sent to all of the neighbors um, on various Bible verses, etc. And I was sure that this was going to go well. And then when they expressed a different opinion than me, um, I was very staunch in defending my position. Instead of allowing them to develop their position and then allowing them to see the weaknesses in their position as we discuss them, and as we work through them. And so this is a lesson that I had to learn, um, which uh, I think, I guess I must probably still have to learn over time. But it's very important to work with youth in their positions, help them to work out the consequences of those decisions, help them to um, sort of not be judged. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that you don't state what you believe, but you have to do it in a way where you are honest with them, but it, they don't feel judged and that they don't feel attacked. And often this means that you express your affinity to them, your support of them as people, not necessarily based on their behaviors or what they're choosing, but their support as children of God and out of your love for them, that you want to be with them and stand by them, even if they're making decisions contrary to what you believe. And so when that happens, often the, the, the situation can get a little bit negative it can become tense because youth these days are also extremely sensitive. They take offense very quickly. 
and I, I found this as well. I mean, especially communicating via email or something now, we, we're dealing with online learning. You have to be so careful with the tone that you use because you want to encourage and not to um, disencourage. So very important then, when that tension builds up, shift the focus of the discussion. Focus on positive uh, aspects of their development, of their experience, of their church life or whatever it is that you're talking with. And um, at times, you may need to help them play out their, their, um, their negative position as well and see what the outcomes will be and, and, and sort of be there to support them through that. And like I said, that's a very difficult thing to do. So these are some of the suggestions that I've, I've, uh, I've got um, with dealing with youth from a sort of uh, a, a perspective of um, spirit of prophecy combined with approaches that we often use in counseling with youth. Um, I was wondering if anyone has uh, any questions. And then uh, the last thing I'll just add is sort of my own experiences as a youth that I remember and what stood out and what I learned from that. But uh, at this point in time, I wanted to open it up. I don't know, AJ, if you want to take, uh, uh, take questions or Bulelani, if you're going to take questions. Um, and then let's take a look if there are any areas that people want to explore and, and delve more deeply into. I think if there's anyone that has a question, thank you, Conrad. I think that was very insightful. Um, and I like the points that you mentioned. Um, are there any questions from, from anyone over here? Even those on Facebook, you guys can uh, just share questions in the comments and we will see how we can answer them. Um, but yeah, from the, from the floor, anyone? Um, and maybe <clears throat> I... Maybe let me say this. I, I appreciate. I see some of you on my screen. Uh, you you busy writing down uh, points. Uh, we will appreciate that. It, it it shows that you you part of us and you know what it means to be here. Uh, I thought I should say that. Um, yeah. So any questions? So I see pa Palisa has one question. Oh yeah. Yes. Palisa, please come in. I just want to ask a quick one. Is it possible if you could give us a practical example? Um, when you started speaking about the, the, the kids being very emotional at this age, I could start seeing, like, practically in club meetings and every time we're together, everything that you actually mentioned, I was able to see. But now when it comes to um, trying to sort of not reprimand, but um, also to encourage how do we do so I'll, I'll give an example and maybe if you can just give me back an example of, of how you would then uh treat that in um treat that situation based on the quotation you gave us from ellen white based on also the the the, the points that you mentioned let's say a child shows up to club meeting um or to church and they have blue braids and um I understand we need to be sympathetic and loving. Do we ignore? Do we speak? How do we speak? Um, is, is it about a tone of voice? Is it about what you say or how you say it? When you say it? Um, those are the kind of examples that I'd like because I think um, some of us might experience things like this and it might not just be the hair. It might be things that are even worse or more extreme than that. Okay. Um, AJ, you, you want me to answer on that? I think go for it, Connie. So if, I think it's a good question. Um, I think when, it, when they've asked, asked the question, I think maybe you should just answer straight immediately after they've asked. asked yeah, it. yeah. Okay, I, yeah, I, yeah I, I wanted to open it up because obviously I'm not, I'm not the only one and I'm possibly not the, 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 the expert here on youth. All of you guys are most probably much more experienced working with youth than I am. Um, but let me just share my opinion then on that. I think when, when you engage with youth, we have, to, we have to do what we want them to do. So one of the first things we want them to do is always think carefully about their position and what they're doing. 
So before you engage with youth, it's very important to be goal oriented in your interaction. You have to try and think, what am I trying to achieve? Right. Then you need to think about what are they trying to achieve? So in other words, for example, the, the, the braids or, or colored hair or nose ring or whatever it is, what are they trying to achieve? So very often what they're trying to achieve with this, remember that they live in a very visual um, and artificial world. So social media doesn't allow much for displaying character, you know, displaying things like, um, you know, your, 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 your love of God or displaying things mm -hmm. that we would, we value like all the fruits of the spirits, patience, and, you know, all of these kind of things is very much focused on what you look like on Instagram, you know, and, oh. and these kind of things. So it's very superficial. So what are they trying to achieve with this? Is they're trying to achieve acceptance. If I've got, you know, blue hair or I've cut zigzags into, into my head or whatever the case may be, why am I doing that? It's because this is something that's seen as acceptable in my social context. This is seen as something that makes me be desirable to others. This is make, something that makes me fit in. So if you understand what you want to achieve, so in other words, you want them to assimilate into a culture of Adventism, right? At the same time, what they want to achieve is they want to achieve an assimilation into their social context. Then you try and think, okay, how do I get a win-win situation here? How do I get them to assimilate into an Adventist culture? And at the same time, meet their need to feel accepted, to be cool, to, you know, be attractive or whatever it is that they're trying to achieve. Mm. And so in that kind of situation, for example, I would see, okay, having the blue hair maybe is not necessarily going to um, negatively impact on my culture of Adventism. Um, and I can make them feel, you know, uh, appreciated and wanted here, but for something else. And giving, allowing that to develop to be part of their sense of identity. Remember that development is a long-term process. It's not something short. This, this is also very important. We, we like quick fixes. I think this is not something that just the youth like. We like it as well. We like to be able to say something and see a change. Yep. But if you think about it, the way in which we grow and develop as Christians is very slow. I mean, when I think of myself, I can see the way that God has worked in my life and has changed me. But it hasn't been from one day to the next. And there's many things that he's had to persevere with me for such a long time. And it, that's part of my deep joy is that God has persevered for, with me for such a long time. Mm. So I think with youth, we also have to, we have to take that same approach. We have to say, what am I wanting to achieve with this interaction that I'm having with the youth? How am I going to do that? And it might not be a short-term thing. It might be over a long period of time. So, for example, with the, with the blue braids, I may say to the person, wow, uh, there's those braids on you, right? What made you want to get blue hair? You know? And then you could say, you know, something like, well, you know what? That uh, the, the way that you deal with, uh, you, and then be genuine. So identify something really that's there. So let's say that person is very friendly and warm with everyone, you know? Then you can say, wow, you know, that, that's really cool. But for me, the thing that really stands out for me when I see you or when I think about you, it's just that warmth that you have with everyone who attends our meeting. Mm. Yeah. So you, you've managed to make them feel warmth and accepted and you've shifted their focus from what is, you know, in the virtual world is, is sort of focused on to something of what is important within the Adventist culture that is your goal in trying to achieve. If I can, if I can add on to what you're saying there, Conrad, I think the concept of empathy, and he, he mentioned empathy in what he was sharing. Empathy is saying, I want to understand 
what's happening in your life right now. Um, I, I, I'm not in your life. I have no idea what's taking place, but can you explain to me what's happening? And, and by you building a relationship with a young person, irrespective of what they look like, what they've done to their hair, if they've shaved half their head off or whatever, um, even if they've done some extreme things like gone to get a tattoo, and this is a controversial subject, um, mm. it, it, how are we going to deal with that? If we're going to relate to them in such a way to, to understand what's happening in their life, guess what's going to do? They, they're actually going to confide in you when they're actually struggling with, a, with an emo emotional challenge or even a, a family challenge or maybe even a, a stress that they're facing at school. Um, so the concept of empathy is something that I believe is riddled throughout the Bible. And we'll actually look at Jesus Christ. He, he came down to earth. He incarnated to become human so that he can dwell amongst us. Isn't that a form of empathy? Mm. I, I would think that it's a form of empathy because he's actually experiencing what humanity is going through so that he can relate to us um, properly and, and cohesively in, in our lives. So when you're challenged by, by those things, I see someone has just commented, they went and said that we have to choose the right time to speak about things. And I, I would suggest keep on praying. When you see those blue braids or um, dyed mm. hair, you pray. You're like, Lord, please just help me understand what I need to do right now. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I like that. Thank you for the question. I see uh, Mutanda has, uh, she says she's listening with her daughter and her daughter would like to respond. And uh, okay, says, by all means respond, please. Yes, we want that response. Daughter. Um, hi, um, good, good night, well, good, good, after, evening. good evening, everyone. How I wish, how I wish we could see your face, Doctor. Good <laughs> I, um, hi, um, there you are, thank you so much, it's good to see you. It's, it's good to be here, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, you guys said that my generation's sensitive, and I don't really think that, just um, because of the fact that I don't, it's not necessarily sensitivity, it's more of, we're more empathetic, and the fact that we have so much um, information and the accessibility to get that information, and it's all of the passion that we have on certain subjects that doesn't make us um, s sensitive or aggressive, but more... Um, more expressive and more outspoken because we have such big platforms aware, yes. um yes more socially aware um especially towards um issues in our own communities and um, such as a platform of tiktok where people have the platform to speak on things and educate others on matters that they themselves are passionate about and therefore more people could become passionate about it and then it turns into this whole community of we are passionate about one thing and how what can we do to help what can we what can we improve in certain aspects and um i feel like we're very out there and we do what we want to when we want to so in the long run Yes, um, adults do play a lot, a, a big part of what our decision decisions are. But at the end of the day, it's something within us that like we decide to have something like blue hair. And if someone tells us that, oh, that's not right, or no, you shouldn't have blue hair, it doesn't look good. Like we're at the end of the day gonna decide whether we want it or not. Okay. <laughs> So how should adults approach it? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I like it. I like well. it. A good point. Thank you, Ntanda. 
Anybody have a comment on that? Because uh, she's she's coming from being an ambassador. She's coming from being a, a young person, it's... and that she she's testifying mm. about what what's going on in their mind. And I think that's that's very powerful. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. Can I can I speak to that, AJ? Go for it. I uh, I unfortunately don't have the quote with me, but uh, it's a very powerful po a quote from Ellen White that speaks specifically to that of using the passion of youth um, to be. Uh, she 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 called them soldiers in an army of Christ, and that when the youth become that army for Christ, they would achieve amazing things, specifically because of that passion and that you know as adults we more risk aware. We have more restraint. We are worried about consequences and you know processes and all of these kind of things. And and youth are not restrained by those kinds of concerns. So I think that that um, we can make use of that passion. You know, if we allow youth that space to express their passion for Christ and to develop that passion for Christ for Christ. They will be able to achieve amazing things, and uh, it's important to 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 recognize that 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 what I was speaking. I think th th everything she said they just demonstrated that strong sense of individuation. There you go. Of I want to do it my way, right? And so our goal then, as 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 leaders, is not to not to put ourselves in opposition to that passion, yes. but to create a structure to guide that passion for Christ. Because one of the strongest ways that youth will develop an identity as Christians, as young Adventist ambassadors is through mission. And so if we create the structure where they can take that through whichever platforms they find are, are, are effective, and that they enjoy using, that uh, we can make use of that passion um, mm. and, and also pick out what is important and what is not important. You know, mm. there, there are certain things that, yes, the Bible speaks about, you know, not marking yourself with a tattoo, but ultimately is that as important as, you know, engaging that person in ministry, you know, whatever the case may be. So we need to set priorities when we engage with youth and take a look carefully at what we're trying to achieve on the long run. Um, in parenting, this is called positive parenting. When we respond to children, we often respond in terms of short-term outcomes. Mm. So for example, mm. I'm running late. So I'll shout at the children and say, hurry up, we're running late. But what we need to do is we need to think in terms of our long-term outcomes. My long-term outcomes are things like I want my child to be to be patient. I want my child to, um, you know, to to care about others or whatever the case may be. So in in the way that I'm reacting to the short-term thing, of I'm being late, am I teaching them patience, which is my long-term goal? And so the same thing with youth. When I engage with youth about a tattoo or something like that. My short-term goal is, oh, that's not appropriate here or something like that. But what is my long-term goal with that youth? My long-term goal with that youth is that they develop a love for Christ and a mission for Christ so that they can't be attacked by Satan, so that he won't throw them off the path. And then I have to think, okay, in my interaction now, am I going to achieve a short-term goal or am I going to achieve that long-term goal? Cool. Thanks. I I think there's another hand that's popped up. Palessa, you, you have your hand up again. Um, just uh, furthermore to what Intanda said, I love um, what she said, especially when she mentioned TikTok and that whole kind of vibe. Um, sure. This is practically how um, the, the young people um, would like to express themselves um, and in the church. Now, the, the point and maybe sort of question that I'd like to um, maybe ask is how do we as leaders, right, protect them from the comments and the negativity that may come or that may come from the church as a result to 
um, how they express themselves. For me, it's very um, um, practical because we had young people doing a program and they were doing spoken word, which is poetry. Yeah. And some of them are, are, are young men doing sp spoken word with a bit of rhythm in it. And it, mm. it, the message is powerful. So they had a lot of backlash, um, which was very negative and denting also, especially um, to what we've actually learned here. It, it literally went against everything we've learned here. So my question is, how do we as leaders um, maybe educate the church or how can the conference help us to educate the church on how um, to be accepting of the young people and how the young people express themselves? Um, mm. And, and what boundaries are there in the ways, um, like for TikTok, what boundaries are there for young people um, that we as leaders can also have to say that you can go this far and no further? I think uh, Ntanda actually answered that to some degree. If they want to make up their mind to do something, they're going to do something. Um, but uh, Connie, do you have something or pass the bombs? Yeah, unfortunately, we we always meet with you, uh, Balisa, as as leaders, and we we feed you with all this kind of information, <clears throat> uh, which you guys transfer to our ambassadors, and we we never get a chance to meet with the whole church, uh, which I think is the challenge as you raise it, um, and and uh, yeah, of course. Uh, that that would be it's one of the difficult things to to meet you know with uh, with, with with local churches mm. um and and then how i wish we could build a strong foundation on our ambassadors um and i think it's 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 uh, it's more like uh, an idea of of knowing your of knowing the right um what do you call it the right, the right South African um, um, note in terms of money. You you must know and learn the right note, and never learn a fake one because a fake one keeps changing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm using this example to say, let's. I, I would suggest because we, we will not have time to meet with all the churches. I suggest that we we will spend our time. Are building a strong foundation and a strong hedge around our ambassadors, um, you know, giving them this 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 idea and be open um, to them that churches will we will keep bashing and attacking them on on some of the things, um, and but slowly but surely we 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 get a platform where we we address our our local churches but in the meantime uh, build a strong uh, foundation so that they don't crack and mm. and um, um and, and and run away leave church simply because someone else has made a, a funny comment but i think it's 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 high time that we probably start considering making rounds and uh, and i know uh, have been assisting a great deal in making rounds, uh, visiting churches in, in, their, in, in, in promotions. That in our churches it's on, on how to deal with young people. Uh, because I, I, I can believe young people they leave church because they see church as, as, as no place to be. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe so 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 i would really encourage that we we we, we go out there and and then do a campaign and, and prepare our churches yeah come in aging um i think if i can like, add there it's it's important for us yeah. to realize the, the generational gap that we have within our churches and we're sitting with maybe four different generational mindsets um of, of people and then also we're coming from different uh, homes we we coming from different areas which have dealt with situations differently. So we have a lot of, we've got a lot of gaps to bridge. We've got a lot of gaps that we have to build bridges over. And the only way we can do that is by building relationships, spending time with the elderly, mm. spending time with the youth. Um, uh, the one church that I was involved with, the young people 
had a monthly uh, meal prepared for the elderly and they would actually invite the elderly to the church and they would prepare the meal and they would serve the, the elderly people to, to spend time with them and then sit down with them at the table and talk with them and get to know them on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and this was important for when I realized that, they, I, I realized that they were actually trying to relate. And I think in that sense, for us to empathize from each person's perspective, we're going to bridge those gaps that we, that we actually face. Um, Conrad, you want to maybe add something there? I don't know. I think, uh, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's a, a good experience I can share from when I was in, in youth. Um, we had a similar program where the youth would go and have Friday night uh, uh, Sabbath openings. Um, at different houses of people, you know, the, 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 this really helped to bridge that gap between the youth and the, and the older people in the church. And um, that, that ability, I think one of the things that, that really makes the biggest difference is when elder people see that youth have a passion for Christ. Yeah. Because that's something that really unites us. You know, we can have so many differences. But when you see that that fire is burning within some child who, you know, some youth that you previously just saw as being, you know, not reverent in church and this and this and that, you know, mm -hmm. afterwards, when you see that that passion is burning inside this child, this youth's heart, that helps to start bridge that gap, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think very important is creating opportunities for that interaction in a, in a positive way. You know, through youth serving the, the, the older people in the church and through the older people in the church creating um, opportunities to connect, to join. Another, another good program that I think that we, we could develop a lot in our churches is um, they have this, uh, I'm trying to take the, the, get the, the right phrase for it, but take a child to work. I don't know if you can call it, we say take a child, but take a youth to work kind of thing. You know, allow youth in the church to shadow adults in their mm. workplace mm. you know mm. and and get a perspective of that person living their christianity in their workplace mm. and that can also help to build them in more ways than just what is typically experienced within the within the church setting you know because youth especially want to see people being genuine christians mm. And in the church, you'll sometimes have parents, you know, behave one way in church, behave a completely different way at home. And that's what really puts youth off. That's what makes them not like church because it's seen as a disingenuous uh, space. Mm -hmm. And they like things to be real, you know. And so allowing youth to experience people being real, you know, in different contexts is a great way to bridge those barriers. To, to, to form those connections. Yeah. So that's just a, a, a suggestion based on some of the experiences I had as a youth. Thanks. I saw uh, Pelo's hand went up a little bit earlier, but she takes it down and she puts it back up and then she takes it down. And... Do you want to say something, ma'am? Someone from Queenstown. Pelo, come in. Yes, thank you, thank you, Pondis. I, 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 I put my hand down because um, your responses to to Palisa's question responded to to my kind of situation or the question that I was about to ask because I was going to share my feeling that I I don't know if perhaps I feel too possessive of of the youth that I am leading when I have a challenge with the roles and responsibilities of the deacon and my responsibilities towards the youth. But now you will realize but the, 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 the deacons are doing their role. But I, I, I sometimes feel if I am put there to be the leader to the youth, they, 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 there should be some relations whereby they would be able to understand that perhaps with this situation, um, I would handle it 
better because I am put there because there is an, a belief that I am able to speak their language. So I, I sometimes feel very hurt when I find uh, one or some of the youth uh, going home head because the deacon did this or, or spoke like this uh, when when of course the deacon correctly was trying to address something you see so I, I think uh, your response is to say perhaps we need to engage uh, the, the entire church to get to understand the youth and so and so on and to get our youth to understand uh, uh, the, the, the adults as well so that for me I think uh, one would need to explore that further hmm. thank you ma'am thank you thank you I, I see there's a few there's a few points here in the chat there um, Pastor Bombs, and I think we can maybe close off in about five minutes. But I think there's one question. It says the thing I struggle with is how to how to not make it about me. I can see that they are playing me, but not sure how to respond. And uh, this this is a it's quite a good good point. When you're having meetings, you can see you're doing something, and then the young people are like, uh, "I'm going to test their limits. Mm. Just push them to their <laughs> limits." And the question mm. that they have is, how do I respond and how do I deal with this thing? Um, well, if I can maybe share my perspective, a lot of the times uh, I believe that uh, if, if I can relate to them, um, they, they tend to also want to play and push your limits, but you also have to understand where your limits are. Um, and uh, respect them so that because they respect you, but they're actually, they, they're being young people. They're pushing you to your limits to see when you're going to crack. Um, and uh, sometimes it's, it's good to show that you can crack. Other times it's good to be like, you know what? I'm not going to give it to you. Um, and uh, I guess ambassadors are watching this and they're like, hmm, I'm going to push past the AJ to his limits someday. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Here's the thing. We have to be vulnerable sometimes. And I believe that as a leader, we've got to also show that we're human, right? Um, and that, that we, we, uh, we struggle with certain aspects. Um, they gave an example and it says, I plan a social and they see a chance to date. Um, mm. And uh, it depends on what that question, what that phrase means, date. Um, because uh, I think them spending time with each other is good, but if they're going to push the limits to actually go and hide behind the, you guys understand what I'm saying, um, vanish with the dark, dark corners. And, yes. Uh, yeah. Then, then we've got to start to understand what's happening because then there's, then there's might be, there might be things happening within their life, um, which they're trying to fill with, with external factors. Um, so yeah, what are your guys thoughts? Maybe shortly, not too long. Yeah, especially those of you who, who are officers. Zandi, I see you. What are you thinking? She's cold. She's cold. <laughs> She's good. <laughs> you cold. You, okay, well, good? Here's, a, here's um, another, another point, Pastor Bong. Here's another point here. They, they asked, how do I connect good. with them? when they feel that they are too close to their parents, when they feel that I'm too close to their parents, I need ways to break the generational gap. Also very good, very good point. How do I do that? Should I read it again? I'll read it again. It says, how do I connect with them when they feel that they are, when they feel that I am too close to their parents' age, I need ways to break that generational gap. Anybody? I'm gonna I think, them. I think H A. Um, Parents should be our partners in youth ministry. Yeah. 
when there's a when there's a break in in relationship with parents then that will manifest in a break with relationship with other other adults as well yeah. and so you know with when we're working with youth we're working with the whole context the whole system yeah. so we have to work mm -hmm. with elder people in the church as well who maybe don't like youth or whatever the case may be but we have to work with parents they they are our first partners in youth ministry um because whatever whatever goals we are trying to achieve with youth if parents are not achieved are aiming for the same goals then we at cross purposes and you're gonna really struggle mm. um and that conflict and that sort of um disconnection with parents is going to reflect in disconnection with any other adult figure mm. so i think it's very important to engage in youth ministries family ministries together so that you can ensure that 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 separation is first addressed in the home so that it can be more meaningfully addressed in other contexts and those work hand in hand so i think that's that's very important to see that youth are are seeing their peers as much more important to them but actually this generation of youth is much more connected to their parents than many other uh, generations in the yeah. past um sometimes in, in a negative sense that, that some parents are over um uh, what you call this the the, the parenting they, the style they have is this, this just let the kids be you know etc they run off and do their own thing and whatever the case may be you know it's like i want to be their friend and not the enemy and all of this kind of thing um which does become problematic as well sometimes but it's important to build those connections, the trust, you know, all those important foundations between youngsters and their parents as well. And obviously sometimes that's not possible, hmm. but uh, where it is, I think we must affirm those connections and those bonds of families because it'll make your work as a youth leader much more easier. I think that's a, that's a good, good point there to take parents into consideration and when a child actually equates you to their parents and they don't want to actually talk to you that actually means that there might be some challenges at home which mm. uh, which which sends you in the right direction to see how you can relate to the parents but also the child and just watch out for becoming the the one that that becomes the glue between the child and the parent and when you're not mm. there anymore that uh, things might fall fall flat again um, but yeah, hey guys, I think we can continue talking about this for for days on end, right? This is an important aspect, and uh, I want to I want to I want to encourage everyone. Yeah. Let's continue to talk about this. Let's continue to share ideas and relate, and uh, yeah. maybe we'll we can have another session sometime. Um, Pastor Bom, something from you? Do you have something on your mind? Um, nothing, my friend, except to express a word of gratitude to all of our youth leaders, ambassador leaders mm -hmm. uh, for joining us. I, so I, I can tell you, uh, uh, Dr. Zygmunt, that, that was powerful. Mm -hmm. And I so wish all of our leaders uh, uh, were part of us to, to hear what has been presented. We, because if, if we, it's more like working together, we trying to build this wall. And um, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Um, like, for instance, I know, I know it's very difficult to, to work with Papa, even to have, even to have you guys um, working in 2020 as ambassador leaders. We, we can only appreciate that because I know a lot of elected members who just run away from ambassadors and like, no, 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 no. Right. Um, yeah. And we will appreciate it. I can tell you they're not so difficult to deal with. If, if, if you followed uh, Dr. Zygmunt uh, presentation, uh, you will really enjoy how to work with them. You, you just have to have a timing, that's all. I don't know what that means. Um, ask a Tsotsi outside there, he will tell you. But <laughs> you just need to be fuck her up. That, uh, you just need to wake up. Um, um, uh, that's, the, that's the biggest step you, you need to take. Just be awake. Uh, because if you are sleeping, I can tell you, 
um, those guys will run over you. Um, and they will do so not because they are naughty, but they will do so simply because you are sleeping. Yes. Um, so thank you so much, Jane. Thank you so much. Yeah. So maybe I can add this recording has been recorded and it will be available on Facebook as well as on YouTube. So if you guys want to share this, please go and maybe create a watch party. Um, go and share this because I think the other youth leaders and ambassador leaders can relate to this as well as your church members. If you would like to create a watch yeah, party yeah. for your church members, share this because they will also learn something through this presentation. Mm. And uh, maybe that will spike the conversation for you to continue within your local church. So uh, I would like to thank you for being part of this tonight. And uh, thank you, Conrad, for taking time out. I know Friday nights is family time. And uh, say thank you to the family and the, the kids that they gave you to us for a short, short time tonight. But, uh, yeah, maybe yeah, let's... yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for you guys, for leaders, for, for joining us. Maybe let's just close off with a word of prayer and then we can go through the rest of this weekend with God guiding us. Let's close our eyes. So tomorrow, please don't... Uh, let's close eyes. Um, Father, thank you that we have this privilege of, uh, of coming to your throne of grace and mercy and, and allowing you, Lord, to speak to our hearts. And as we... As we participate through this weekend, may you always be with us, Lord. And as we try and figure out how to deal with the challenges that we face with, with the young people of our church, where they've got many controversial questions and subjects that they want to deal with, Lord, may you give us the wisdom and the knowledge to, to be, be able to answer according to the word of God. Thank you that you brought us together and thank you for the presentation. And may this be uh, of insightful um, resource an insightful resource for us to actually minister properly to the ambassadors be with us now as we head through the rest of this evening may you bless us abundantly lord we pray this in your name alone amen, amen.